years of this inner work with no externalization, we felt like we finally had something maybe worth sharing. It wasn't like we finally got an idea and we ran out to share it. It was very, you know, to some degree seasoned and matured, at least conceptually, before we ever bothered to try to share it with anyone. So we formed uh, a nonprofit and based it in California near uh, San Francisco called the Institute of Heart Math. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of the Institute was is to develop a system of simple tools and techniques that anybody could use to improve their lives. Not just the intelligent, not just the spiritual, but ordinary people. So they could benefit. Doc a long time ago said by the turn of the century, you're going to see tremendous stress levels in the world. And people are going to need something. They're going to need something they can use in their own lives to, you know, to be able to, to handle that and to find their own self-security. What year was, it, was he saying that? He was saying that when I first met him back in the, you know, 1971, you know. Okay, so he was like 29 years down the track, he was saying. He was thinking about all that way in advance and basically because of his care for people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Institute was set up to begin to structure that system. How would we share that? And just as importantly, to do scientific research. So we brought in scientists. We developed a very prestigious scientific advisory board and we put researchers on our staff and we began to research heart-brain communication. How does the heart communicate with the brain and the rest of the body? What does that mean? What does that do? And then taking that further, what are the effects of positive emotional states on performance and health? We've seen a lot of research on the negative emotions, anger kills and all this, this type of research had been well documented. But we found very little literature on the effect of positive emotions. What's the physiological benefit of care or appreciation or love? You know, how does that impact somebody's ability to perform in the game of life? we began to do that kind of research. And then we started developing techniques. We took and we study those techniques from a research perspective. So we had this solid empirical underpinning to everything that we did. Then we started writing books and then formulating training programs. And the first training programs were for educators to help school teachers with you know, their stresses and with their performance. Then we took that into corporate training and into personal development seminars. And the corporate training was in major, we, we were able to work that in over time through doing case studies with them, showing the effectiveness of our, of our training, showing them uh, bottom line, uh, return on investment driven results. And uh, expanded upon that and we were training in Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies. This all kept growing and growing and growing and the media kept reporting on us. Very positive stories on national TV and major print publications. And um, it just kept growing. And more and more people were attracted to us and our staff grew and our expertise grew. We got better at what we did and we started sharing it with more and more people. And the research kept the research following kept following it, it, kept going and kept supporting it so that we could go into mainstream organizations with a message about the heart, but it was a new message. It was a message about the heart, but it wasn't just confined to philosophy and spirituality. Mm -hmm. It was about uh, the power of the heart to really improve the quality of life and to improve the quality of performance in whatever we do, whether it's business or sports or raising our families. In everyday life. Every day. We need to take another break and we'll come back and hear more about Howard's journey. Welcome back, and we're talking with Howard Martin from HeartMath. And before that last break, Howard, you were talking a little bit about the uh, the journey of HeartMath mm -hmm. and the research it's based on. And for those viewers that have been staying with us over the past few weeks, they would have seen the program we did with Greg Braden. Yeah, sure. Who is a great advocate of HeartMath. That's great. Good to know. 
And you were saying when I was talking with you earlier today that you have a number of people who are internationally working out there as spiritual leaders, um, transformational teachers, and yet they have found their way to heart math. Why is that? And, and also, um, you're also saying international sports people? You know, leaders in a variety of fields. You know, we've, HeartMath is an interesting organization that we've, we've got a viable, proven system that's helping a lot of people. And we're, we're very neutral in a sense. I mean, we, we can appeal to lots of different kinds of people because when you apply heart, it, it adds value to about anything. And so it's, it's found its way into a lot of different places and a lot of different people. I think we've been, uh, we, we try to be caring to people. We've done our homework on our research, so we have a solid bottom line to us. Uh, there's a neutrality factor that I mentioned. And because of that, we have attracted a lot of people uh, to heart math. And I think that uh, everyone has a lot of stress in their lives today, whether they're rich or they're poor, whether they're unknown or whether they're famous. And we've got something that can help, and I think that because of that, a lot of people are, are attracted to us. Okay. And you mentioned earlier the book that you and Doc wrote. What's mm -hmm. the name of that book? It's called The Heart Math Solution. Mm -hmm. And what's it about? It's pretty much an overview of, the, of heart math, the whole entire system for the first 10 years at least. And it's, uh, it discusses the science, gives a good breakdown on that. It's got practical tools and techniques that people can practice that are in the book. Uh, it's got uh, three chapters all about emotion. You know, and the power of emotion, and how to regulate and, and better manage emotions for you know for our own benefit. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very useful book, and it's a very um, informative book. Okay, could you then share a little bit with us about that area of the power of emotion? Well, it's real important. It's one of my main messages today. You know, and I've said this many times publicly, and I'll say it here in Australia. You know, <laughs> uh, I believe that learning how to better regulate our emotions represents the next frontier in human evolution. So we have this great gift. We have this power of emotion. We can feel more than any living thing on this planet. And yet emotion becomes this, this problem for us. You know, it takes us up. It takes us down. It, you know, emotions burn us. Don't you know, show your emotions. Don't feel your emotions. All these things that are, are said about emotion. And I think that, that we're missing the great gift here. You know, it's, it's a capacity that we have that adds enrichment to our life. It adds texture to our lives. Life without feeling is a, would be a very uninspiring uh, life. You know, just a pure objective life with no emotional component to it would not be much of a life at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's a great gift, but yet it's an underutilized gift. And it's a misused gift in many ways. And I don't see how we can really advance the intelligence of the human species until we, we pay more attention to understanding our emotions and utilizing our emotions. And it can be a fun adventure. It's not a scary thing. It's not bad to look at our emotions. It's, it's important to see what we're feeling. Because every moment of every waking day, we are feeling. And we're feeling something. And many people think of emotions as simply reactions that they have very little control over. I, on the other hand, feel like they're choices that we can choose the emotions we want to feel. Mm -hmm. And what would higher consciousness be if it wasn't things like being able to feel like we want to feel when we want to feel it? What a great gift to be able to change our emotional state in the moment, to shift those emotions and feel the way we want to feel. And in fact, we can do that. That's the good news. You're getting really excited. Yeah, well, this, I is can... a, <laughs> this is the good news, though. We have the, human, we have the capacity to do this. And part yeah. of what heart math teaches is how do we do this? Mm -hmm. It's part where the techniques are really all about. But, you know, people want more fulfillment and enrichment in their life. Uh, and I don't believe it's possible to have that unless people take on a new level of emotional maturity and self-regulation and just bring in that maturity and their own dignity and apply it towards, you know, really, you know, really looking at their emotions and choosing emotions that are most beneficial to them. Okay. Well, you use the word, is it coherent? Coherence, yeah. How, how do you use that and what does it mean as far as heart math goes? Well, part of our research is understanding this heart-brain communication. And what we found is when the heart and brain are in optimal communication, the nervous system is synchronized. All the body systems are synchronizing to that. And the hormonal regulation is, you know, is, is outputting hormones in the body that are regenerative for us. And, and all the other systems are synchronizing to the heart as the master controller. Uh, we enter a state called coherence. I mean, the scientific term is psychophysiological coherence. And it's a state accompanied by clarity of thought and feelings of positive emotions. It's very clear. It's very dynamic. It's very active. It's peaceful and calm, but it's also, again, very aware. It's not a sleepy type of a feeling. It's an energized feeling, but a balanced and centered feeling. And uh, all of our training programs really are designed to teach people how to increase the coherence levels.